about it. I said, eat. We have snacks. Yeah, we have snacks. Um, <clears throat> welcome to Malvern Books. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. It's a beautiful night. It's mm -hmm. finally not 2,000 degrees outside or 2 billion percent humidity. So uh, on this beautiful evening, we're going to have really, really a fantastic reading. I know it. And we are going to start with Abe Louise Young. Abe is a believer in the power of words generosity, and the vulnerability to make meaningful change. She's the author of three chapbooks of poetry, including Poem for a Friend Growing Lighter and Lighter, forthcoming in the spring 2019 from Dancing Girl Press. She's also the author or editor of numerous guides for educators, including the free guide Queer Youth Advice for Educators How to Respect and Protect Your LGBTQ Students. She was nominated Best Activist in Austin in 2017 by the Austin Chronicle for her work mobilizing hundreds of people to prevent homelessness by building personal resource sharing networks with families displaced by Hurricane Harvey, an effort called Hurricane Love. Abe holds an MFA from the University of Texas at Austin, where she was a James Missioner Fellow in writing, an MA from Northeast Northwestern University, and a BA from Smith College. Abe? Thank you. Um, well, first I have to thank Malvern Books and Joe Bratcher because this is just the most incredible sacred hall for poetry that we could really ever imagine. And to be a poet and to come basically to step up into the forest here in a little poetry cabin altar um, and share is a, a spectacular <coughs> thing. Um, so this is the first time I've gathered with people since the terrible, filthy debacle of the Supreme Court. And I was gonna ask, I was gonna have some plants in the audience to make noises, um, to make like the guttural physical feelings into noises about what we feel at that filthy act. act. So I'm just gonna start making my no some noise myself, and I'm gonna invite you also in the spirit of poetry to just make some noise, okay, on three. One, two, three. <laughs> to lasso the emptiness, and it's a bit prosaic, but it feels like what I am being challenged to do right now is imagine myself, what my life would actually be if I had never experienced trauma at the hands of men. That may be the underskirt, the underside of our moment in history, when we're all staring at the trauma nonstop, talking about our own, telling it into this Me Too circle, and so we get to ask ourselves this big different breath of a question, Imagine what your life would be if you had never experienced trauma at the hands of men. And this question is, of course, for the men in the room also. Can you imagine? To lasso the emptiness, step into the unknown, they say. But it's so terrifying to go swing both legs over to feel the anger surge that might mean surrendering your full weight to the edge of an eggshell of self, cracking it. This unknown being so fragile, a stepping into meaning, like suddenly falling onto something sharp and shattering it. This unknown can barely be imagined as whole. So step into the unknown and moan and listen for the echo. To imagine my life as whole, the girl in me unshattered, Surely it means something like to swallow something living, like a small brown bird, just to feel it flutter and rise up against the glottis to try and escape my throat. Step into unknown with the golden lasso, 
quivering, spinning, and whipping your emptiness out like hurricane air. Here's my forearm, forearm taunt. And because I can only go into the unknown alone, I jump over my own rope into the center of the lasso, spinning at my waist, and drop it before it burns my skin. What I'm trying to say is, I can't imagine who I might be if I'd never been harmed by men. Maybe I'd be a giant woman, six feet taller. Maybe I'd have future vision. Or you could see through my flesh to my skeleton and in my bright city refuge of a heart. Maybe I'd be a human river of laughter or a daughter avenger stalking from city to city unlocking handcuffs. I don't know. What I'm trying to say is that I don't know myself, my other self, but I wish to. I'm calling for her to come forward and be known. What am I holding onto this lasso for? For whom is it on fire? Is it for her? What I mean is my brain, can it make me a new mirror? Can it shatter and still fill in the blanks inside me with yellow yolk? I will begin to imagine my life as if I'd never been harmed by men, when I can wrap my arms around my chest, hold my breath, not encounter show or armor. Notes to myself, keep going right more, not being allowed to have anger, keep going right more, this poem is not done yet. <laughs> That's me in there. So that was from a few days ago when I was just trying to process that stuff because what do we do? What, how do we process it? We just have to pull it through ourselves and make some kind of a noise. Um, <clears throat> This is a, next poem is a very um, simple poem. Someone asked me, why do you like poetry? Um, so I was like, I did not have an answer for that. So I, here's the poem. I like poems. I like poems made in places where moisture gathers, where people fear they smell like sweat fermenting. Poems that hide in those folds of skin that need to be lifted up to be washed underneath. I like poems with humble addresses where a family waits at the bus stop, an IV needle enters an arm, an empanada pools in a napkin, a mouse nests beneath the bush. And I like metaphors that help each other grow, help each other surmount cliche by mating consensually. Metaphors that seek new metaphors to join their union and uphold collective harmony. I like a poem with one single feeling growing stronger or stranger word by word. And I like a poem for justice, read plainly into the microphone outside a prison. A poem that considers who owns this prison, why the prison is full, and why it is full of people deep with brown bodies, lines. A poem with lines that offer, offers thanks for their very survival. I like a poem with simple syntax that pulls a feeling with two oars and two strokes of daring through the water of the unsaid. Because I haven't got time to wait. I'm in a hot, hot climate where ice melts instantly. And mildew grows even on our songs if we pause too long. I need a poem to come to me that works quickly, like a midwife who arrives in her truck with all of her tools and needs no extra instructions. It may be that I am just a tired woman, tired of talking and walking in circles in a colonized country and trying to live without causing anyone any harm, which is impossible to do.
but she uh, published this poem in the Massachusetts Review, which she is a poetry editor of. It's called Dear Enya and Dear Shemaid. Um, and just by coincidence, I found on the internet um, that a London music magazine wrote an article about the 30th year anniversary of the, um, at the watermark by Enya and used lines from this poem all throughout that article. Mm, the world is very big. Yeah. Dear Enya, I read that you live in Ireland all by yourself in a castle with a dog. That you like it because of extreme quiet. Is it true? Did you decide? Google what Lamotrigine does to a fetus, to a fetus and come back to the home. Did you decide not to bring another life into the or did something else decide for you, like medication you have to take or never finding a perfect partner? Dear Enya, my mom played your CD almost every day in our kitchen. Your music filled the air as she cooked, a kind of pre-dinner ritual to beg the goddess that my father wouldn't turn over the table. Dear Enya, I'm slightly defective regarding music because I binge and purge. I'll keep one CD playing in my car for months, or to be honest, years. I listen to it unceasingly, and Enya, as I'm writing to you now, I'm playing Orinoco flow and tears are falling. Your solitary female voice. Dear Enya, I grew up in New Orleans where there is music absolutely everywhere, but it's live music where people are sitting on stools in the street. And Obad is a poem played at, uh, Obad is a poem played at dawn. No, an Obad is a poem sung at dawn as you sneak out of a lover's house. But I think of Obad's, I think of your songs as Obad's, because my mother would hit play on the CD player when the fights were done and my father went up to sleep. Your album was the bookends, my mother's way of asserting her ethereal cleanup control. She couldn't make anything stop or go, but she could add your voice and your hearts on the margins. I thought CDs then were sacred because you could only touch them on the edges. Tapes you could throw around, toss in a bag, find underneath the car seat or in the street, and use your pencil to rewind the long loop of black plastic ribbon. Who am I? Generation X. The tape eager to turn over on itself, to lick its own limb, to curl and then surrender to the slow turn teeth gears. CDs were special. They had to be kept in a jewel box and not touched. A fingerprint could degrade them. Invisible scratches harmed the music. Similar to a woman when she's not allowed car keys or a checkbook or not allowed to leave the house. Dear Sinead O'Connor, I want you to know that when I was in eighth grade, after tripping on LSD at McMain Magnet in, high school, in McMain Magnet in New Orleans, I woke up in the house of a boy I didn't know and asked if he had any scissors. His parents were at home and he did not know where scissors were, but there were hedge clippers and I found them in the backyard shed. I took these to my hair. I could see your face in my mind, Sinead. I could hear the piercing gut range of your yell. Nothing compares to you. Sinead, you used to you before people even had cell phones, and you laid on the gravestone of an apple tree. Cutting off all my hair and then shaving my head caused an instantaneous transformation. Men no longer yelled crude things at me on the street. I got powerful. I wore a thin gold lame zip up hoodie. I wore combat boots and a white dress like you. It's been seven hours and 15 days since you took your love away. Dear Sinead, I've been following your recent breakdowns on social media and I'm sorry. I read that you were diagnosed with bipolar disorder and when you got the drug Lamotrigine, it felt like a giant pothole in the center of the road that you'd fallen into every single time you tried to get somewhere, got filled in with cement, paved, paved over, and smoothed. And then you realized, you said on TV for the first time, what it feels like to be a person who can walk on a road. Sinead, I love when you posted that on Facebook. I felt the same way when I took Lamotrigine. I went from lying in bed, unable to swallow anything that wasn't a liquid for almost two months, 
unable to say anything that wasn't first to sob or dress myself or answer the phone. I wanted someone to drive me to Walmart so I could buy a gun and bullets, and everyone I knew said no, and I cursed them. My lover in a different city ordered hot vegan lasagna delivered to me. My mother came to do a ritual with me because we thought maybe her mother was attacking me from the spirit world and draining my life force by riding my body. My mother yelled, Folly, get off my daughter. Leave, you're not welcome here. Unhand my daughter to her dead mother. And I cried because clearly she loved me. When my lover came back, she took me to a psychiatrist. I got a, prom a prescription, a promotion. <laughs> I got a prescription for Lamotrigine. Sinead, my hole was paved over three days later. I popped out of bed ready for a haircut. I put on bright primary colored eyeshadow, and my list of people to thank was at least three feet long. Sinead, I hear that you've heard, you've had or adopted six children. Is it true? Will Enya, who is childless, come look after you? Dear Enya, on the album cover, you are very Celtic. You are a craggy cliff of woven, flowing garments. A woman without a husband, a wife, or children. The thunderheads are your husband. The moon is your vibrator. We are your children. Sinead, you made poor white girls feel Celtic. I knew I could hate the Pope, wear combat boots, and refuse to buy dream catchers or condoms at the gas station. You gave me permission to be sad and not die. Thank you. Um, so I have a chat book coming out that I thought the box would have come to my house yesterday or today, but it did not. Um, and it's a 16-part a poem called Poem for a Friend Growing Lighter and Lighter. Um, and it charts the, uh, the relationship, um, the, the intimate, hilarious bond when someone very close to you is dying and lets you hang around the whole time. Um, so um, questions, poem for a friend growing lighter and lighter accompanies an exhibit of um, letters between myself and my friend Alan Shevsky. Um, who died in 2014, and we exchanged around 3,000 handwritten um, pieces of correspondence over 13 years. And, um, and then we had to figure out how to keep doing that until we couldn't. Um, and uh, in the exhibit, you follow the letters throughout and can touch them and read them. And the very last letter um, that he wrote was just a series of squiggles um, on a page. but. Uh, and it, it was mailed four days before he died, but that was the thing, you know, that was his occupation was writing me a letter in the mail. So I got it after he died. Um, but here's the poem, um, and it's kind of a journey, it's kind of a journey to the underworld, and then we'll come back out. Um, questions for each other. How are you? I'm on the barbs of stars. How are you? I'm a bug eating through the shirt someone draped on a stone saint. How are you? Soft, moldy orange with the white to green halo. How are you? Sexual hopes redeem my fears. How are you? Lamotrigine, clonazepam, friendship and gliding. How are you? I'm just like you, a septic tank covered in honeysuckle vines, leaking tang. Two. Questions for the surgeon. What are the colors of a neural network? When you sew, do you sing? Are brains as singular as faces? Do they twitch, grimace, get shy, or look away? Is it dark in there? Does it ever flood? Will you also show us your scars? Diagnosis, glioblastoma, which is an aggressive brain tumor. Your left hand is a dead fish, your left leg a sunken anchor, your left eye a black muscle that forgets to move back to the margin to read the next line. It's true, he would go all the way to the end of the line and then get stuck. 
and not remember that you can bring your eyes back up. It forgets to move back to the margin to read the next line. You shave only the right side of your face. You write in a tiny column on the far right edge of the page. Truly, you write, I must emphasize, I ask you to please emphasize with me wholeheartedly. Oh yes, my friend, I do commit to you entirely, to the best of my ability, within the limits of our mutual fragility. For the math stage. Tomorrow, next week, soon, later, afterward, immediately, you say, looking for your options to multiply. Only one arm and one leg are working and a galloping brain tumor is a bastard equation. You need no solving, no saving, but salve me. We do not talk about forever, finally, lastly, in conclusion, in summary, or all in all. We let X still equal X. Five, the anger stage. You're secretly standing at the edge of a mirror, yelling at your face. I hate you, you colostomy bag, you pauper, you faker. You're stomping in the shower to get your life back. You're branding your skin, you're starving your body, you're burning the photos of your childhood because no one is allowed to look at you straight with stage four brain cancer shame. So you stomp on the floor, you break the mirror, but the mirror is a river and it doesn't ever shatter. The river tumbles quietly over stones. Friend, here's the remedy. Imagine yourself already dead. I invite everyone here to do that. Imagine yourself already dead. It's a true pain reliever. Imagine the words we'll say about your life, how sparkling your heart. Imagine the Hebrew songs we'll sing at your memorial under cedar trees and Illinois sky. Imagine our teardrops for you falling one by one into the ground and listen to the words we'll speak and hear your stories. Remember, to some people, you were a clear, unbreakable mirror, and we saw our souls in you, and it was good. Six, the ICU. Night sky, bright black, little silver, dipper, little dipper silver, infomercial on mute, every room in the hall full of lonely twin bed breathing, little dipper, pour it all together into one bowl, stir in good night moon, a spice of sweet melon. Seven, the revelation stage. The speech therapist holds a dull paragraph up about a boy who writes a grocery list and then goes to the store for milk and hot dogs. So he got to the store and bought hot dogs. But what did the boy forget? Hmm? What did he forget, Mr. Shevsky? You try hard to remember, but you can't. I'm a vegan, you say to her. That's why I can't read this stupid thing. Oh wait, I know. The boy who went to the store, he forgot his mother. Hey, biotechnology. A cluster of human nerve cells has been grown on a silicone chip, your caregiver reads lyrically from the New York Times Magazine as he hands over your chemo pills, and you lurch up in the bed to yell, fuck them, fuck them. Yes. In the name of our medical dystopia, and your bald, angry, dapper, Victorian, pee-in-a-bedpan self, fuck them. Silicone chips have no right to Congress with human cells. Eight. Duet. Can I tell you a secret? Yes. I'm wearing a diaper. That's great. We should all wear diapers more often. Are you talking about something else? Like what? Are you making a metaphor for the indestructible soul? I don't know. Is your diaper uncomfortable? No. Then yes. <laughs> Balloon. On the phone to you in your Illinois nursing home, I narrate my summer garden in Texas. Green lizard jumps on the hammock. Oh yeah, big daddy. He struts and pumps his orange balloon throat. I'm male and I'm virile. He's just one big phallus singing, I've got what it takes, baby. And then Alan, the black crow, swoops.
swooped down and whipped him by the tail into her crop. You start to cry. Oh, sweetheart, I'm sorry. This isn't an allegory. It's just a story with the wrong plot. But you are angry that I talked about virility and killing, and you want to hang up. Transit. There's a full lunar eclipse, and I'm outside your new ICU to feel the difference in the light. Two blind girls walk the garden path, whispering. Their white canes trace soft, their white, tra their white canes trace faint crescent moons in the dirt, and their soft shoe soles erase them. Prize. You told the hospital chaplain, here's how I feel about my spiritual life. Vultures, big witches, ate all of the deer on the highway, but the bones and the heart. And now a golden mountain lion creeps down for the prize. The end stage. You are the narrator of this journey in an electric bed, on oars just of your voice, rowing your tumor. We call it the Little Prince across the river. It's epic, this act of dying. It takes a damn long time. I draw your Sephardic profile in gold paint pen on the palm of the bill collector. Who's here, you say, please hold my hand. Your voice is the oars, the boat, the weather, the light. You are entirely becoming transparent, slowly turning into a sheen of sweat without a body a cloud shawl blowing in the doorway. 14, you left your body. Homeless is no word for how an immense ocean of freedom can become captured and like oxygen, release. 15, birth certificate. I dip the paper in water and watch it swell. The wood pulp cell spills. The ink on the birth certificate grows unsure and blurs. An assertion of your birth becomes a murmur, then defers. This paper remembers its mother. Is there any more reason for words? 16. Stone spiral. I drive far from the city to the north woods, build a fire, strip off my clothes under the night sky, open the urn, and pour fine powder palm to palm. I rub my body with the silky grit, stroke your carbon ash on my forehead and belly and cheekbones and arms and legs, I bathe in it. You glow, you taste like nothing else I know. Come. Let's wade into the river now. Breathe deep with me. Dive. Let's go. Thank you. I want to um, finish by reading a poem by Alan, a friend, um, who in his lifetime um, published more than 20 self-published volumes of poetry, each one that was about this big. Um, he just wrote every day and never asked anyone else to publish them. Here's a poem by Ellen, Remembering. And this, this poem was written uh, maybe six months before he passed away. Remembering. I am constantly remembering things I must do and constantly forgetting them. It must be that I have many things to do. I must constantly be having many things to do. I must have many things to constantly do. Oh, forgive me, God, of getting things done. I am a failure at the absence of forgetfulness. I am incomplete in every act of completion. And this is a competition in which I can no longer compete. Yet it all remains completely complete. <laughs> incredibly happy and grateful I am to have Ellen Watson here 
Ellen Watson, whom I met when I was 21, um, graduating and leaving the Poetry Center at Smith College, and um, they were hiring a new director of the Poetry Center at Smith College, and in came Ellen Watson in a peasant skirt with silver bangles up and down her arms, wind blown and beautiful, and took the helm of the Poetry Center at Smith College and has just retired after two years of service. So, Ellen Watson, uh, Joe will read your actual 